who owns art? Is it the artist who creates it? The patron who buys it? Or the man who finds it? Perhaps it is the people whose labor, in the form of taxes and rent, make its creation possible. For most of human history, there was a clear consensus on the matter. Art belonged to the patron who bought it, or the man who found it, and both could do whatever they wanted with it. Not only that, but their acquisition of such art was portrayed as a direct reflection of their virtue and moral character, not the inheritance of fortune or vagaries of luck. Like all those who enjoy wealth and privilege, the owners of art believe that they deserve the treasures in their possession. In a similar vein, the loss of such possession, be it through a reluctant sale or the sacking of the palace by one's enemies, was interpreted as representing the loss of virtue. In 1860, the destruction of the old summer palace in Beijing was interpreted in precisely this manner. The occasion was the Second Opium War, waged by British and French forces in an attempt to enforce the economic concessions of unequal treaties negotiated over the previous two decades. In September 1860, as an Anglo-French expeditionary force marched toward Beijing, word arrived that the Chinese had imprisoned, tortured, and executed several of the foreign negotiators sent ahead of the main convoy. Incensed, Lord Elgin, the son of the same Lord Elgin who had removed the marbles from the Parthenon in Athens, searched for a suitable form of retaliation. Proclaiming his desire to punish only the emperor of the Qing dynasty, rather than the Chinese people as a whole, Elgin decided to set his men loose on the monuments, antiquities, and art of the old summer palace. This, he reasoned, would spare the Chinese people, who had played no part in the emperor's perfidy of any unnecessary suffering. What followed was a wanton orgy of looting, vandalism, and destruction carried out by French and British troops alike. Elgin's logic, if not his actions, was one that was fully embraced by the Chinese, for they too were convinced that the old summer palace belonged to the emperor and the emperor alone. As such, the destruction of its treasures had absolutely nothing to do with the Chinese people. Only the virtue of the Xianfeng emperor himself had suffered exactly as Lord Elgin had intended. Fifty years later, the Qing dynasty was overthrown, and with it went the Manchu ruling house. More specifically, the Azing Bioro family whose line had produced all its emperors. And yet the destruction of the old summer palace still rankles most Chinese people today. Why? At the time, it was not considered an insult to the Chinese nation writ large. It was an insult to the Manchu ruling house alone, and to anyone who served it. We can account for this profound change in perception through the institution of the public museum. More than anything else, the museum is responsible for changing our conception of the ownership of art. When placed in a museum, art can no longer be portrayed as a representation of the personal virtue of individual patrons, but rather a representation of the collective blood, sweat, and tears of the nation said to have produced the talent and wealth necessary to its creation. Azengyoro Pui, the last emperor of China, passed his life on both sides of this ideological divide. Born in 1906, Pui ascended the throne before his third birthday and abdicated before his sixth. In the wake of the revolution in 1911, Pui and his thousands of attendants found themselves in dire financial straits. The Articles of Abdication had granted them the right to continue to reside within the Forbidden City, but without sufficient funds to maintain their luxurious lifestyle. In order to make ends meet, the eunuchs began to sell the art and antiquities of the palace to private dealers in Beijing. Later, Pui himself, along with his brother Pu Jie, did the same. The rulers of the New Republic, alerted to the piecemeal sale of palace goods, decided to halt the exodus of art by turning the Forbidden City into a national museum on the model of Western museums. This was a novel idea. Though by this time China did have a few museums, none were centralized institutions run by the Chinese themselves. In 1829, for example, the British East India Company built the first museum of natural history in Macau. Similar efforts by other foreigners followed. In 1905, the first museum owned and managed by a Chinese director opened its doors to select patrons outside Shanghai. 
but none of these were national museums run by the Chinese government and open to the general public. The first efforts to fulfill these criteria occurred in 1914, when the new Republican government in Beijing held the first public exhibition of the emperor's treasures in two small halls located in the outer court of the Forbidden City. Another exhibition followed in 1916. Both occasions marked the first time ordinary Chinese citizens had ever passed through the gates of the Forbidden City without incurring a hundred blows of the bamboo rod, or worse. But one problem still remained. Hui and his attendants continued to live within the palace, as permitted by the Articles of Favorable Treatment signed in the aftermath of the 1911 revolution. As a result, the fine distinction between Articles of Clothing and Daily Use, now deemed the property of the Azing Yoro clan, and Treasures and Historical Relics, now deemed the property of the state, proved meaningless in practice. The deposed emperor and his attendants continued to treat all palace goods as privately held economic capital, reflective of the former imperial family's exclusive virtue. This quagmire was resolved in 1924, when the warlord Feng Yuxiang marched his armies into Beijing. Hoping to make good on a host of bold, populist promises, Feng ordered Puyi and his household to leave the Forbidden City. Puyi obliged retreating to a mansion in the Japanese concession of Tianjin. Even after he left the Forbidden City, however, Pui still managed to peddle so-called family heirlooms that he had smuggled out of the palace for another 20 years. In 1925, with the Azing Gyoro clan gone at last, the Forbidden City, now known as the National Palace Museum, opened its doors to the public for the first time. Its triumph was short-lived. Just eight years after its inauguration, the new museum fell within the radius of advancing Japanese armies in the Northeast. The new nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek, based in the Yangtze Delta in the distant south, decided to pack up 63,735 objects in crates and ship them to secure storage sites in the foreign concessions of Shanghai. There, they would await construction of a new home in the nationalist capital of Nanjing. In May 1937, all 2,631 crates were relocated as promised, and a national exhibition of imperial art opened to the public. Two months later, the Japanese invaded Beijing, followed soon thereafter by the occupation of Shanghai. Thus ensued what is perhaps the single most remarkable odyssey of art and antiquities the world has ever seen. Over the next 15 years, the National Palace Collection would traverse more than 10,000 miles and endure appalling wartime conditions. The one-time treasures of the Manchu ruling house, now reimagined as the abstract patrimony of the Chinese nation, were deemed so important to the political legitimacy of Chiang Kai-shek's government that they would be protected more vigorously than the lives of the Chinese people themselves. In 1938, as three separate collections of crates were carefully moved inland via rail, boat, truck, and porter to the safety of caves in Mount Ume, Lushan, and Anshun, the nationalists attempted to obstruct the Japanese advance by deliberately destroying the dikes of the Yellow River near Zhengzhou. The resulting floods killed somewhere between 500,000 to a million Chinese peasants. The treasures of the Forbidden City, however, suffered no such casualties. After the war with Japan, all the crates were returned to Nanjing. The resumption of a civil war with Mao Zedong's communist forces, however, ensured that the journey was not yet complete. By 1948, it was apparent that Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists would lose the war. This prompted the incredible decision to take as many crates as possible with the retreating armies to Taiwan. These crates represented about one-fourth of the original collection in Beijing, nearly all the cream of the crop. Once in Taiwan, the crates were stored in two warehouses of a sugar company in Taichung, the least humid city in Taiwan, before again being placed inside mountain caves. Finally, in 1965, work on a new National Palace Museum, built to rival the imperial architecture and grandeur of the Forbidden City in Beijing, was at last completed. The treasures were thus moved one last time, to the northern suburbs of Taipei, where they remain to this day. For its part, the communist government in Beijing, smarting at the loss of so many fine works of art, moved quickly to restock the Forbidden City yet again. Through a vigorous purchasing campaign both at home and abroad, coerced involuntary donations, 
new excavations, and the consolidation of other museum holdings throughout the country, the Forbidden City managed to regain much of its former splendor. Most gratifying to the communist elite, a good number of the objects sold by Puyi, Pujie, and their eunuchs were successfully identified and reclaimed for the museum. Today, there are two different National Palace Museums in two different Chinese republics. Together, they embody both a Chinese commitment to the Western ideal of the modern museum and a repudiation of the ancient precept that art is a reflection of individual rather than collective virtue. They also stand as testament to the exceptional tenacity of Chinese perceptions of cultural continuity with their distant past. But not all parts of China were perceived in such a manner, for far out along the northwestern borderlands, a very different China had begun to emerge from the desert sands. Please join us next time as we explore the Silk Road in episode 14 of Indiana Jones in History. <laughs>